Welcome to the Competitive 40k Podcast brought to you by Vanguard Tactics. This is the Warhammer 40k Podcast where we analyse the meta and develop strategies to help you become a competitive 40k player. I'm your host, Stephen Box, and it is my mission to help raise the standard of the game both on and off the tabletop. So guys, it is episode 13, unlucky for some, but hopefully this won't go too badly for us. Um, And today I'm joined by two co-hosts that I'm going to bring on and introduce to you shortly. One you've heard uh, many a times now, uh, Jack Downing. How are you doing, Jack? I'm all good, Stephen. How are you? Yeah, mate, I'm doing very well. And also joined by Mark Reed today. How are you doing, Mark? Sorry, I had you on mute, which was very unprofessional. Apologies. (laughs) Apologies. <laughs> I was to- I was talking away, and then uh, I wondered why you weren't responding. Uh, I'm really well, thank you. All can- things considered, how are you? Yeah, I'm good. So I kicked this off with uh, episode 13, maybe being unlucky, and there we have it. Look, yeah, first uh, technical issue of today. So um, Jack has been having a little think about a topic for today, and I think it's an absolute corker. So we're going to do Jack's topic for the main segment. We're then going to dive into some of your frequently asked questions over on the Instagram. But I've got some very big news, and that is Vanguard Tactics has now officially rebranded. We have a very good-looking, beautiful logo, um, colour schemes and absolutely everything. Like The old logo was great, but I think this really takes us into that next level where we know we want to be as a show and also company so that's absolutely fantastic i'm super pleased with that we've got some new intros on the way uh, there's a new video up on youtube where i compare all of the uh, factions in 40k so give that a check out it's uh, there's also a big prize to win there for a get started box so if you head over and watch that the details on how to win that box are also there um, and what else is new guys oh we've renamed the mentorship now to be official new name is going to be the Vanguard Tactics Academy. We just felt like the term Academy really summed up the course in a lot better uh, sort of clarity and we are you know changing it to that from now on. So if you hear me talk about the Academy you know that that was the once was mentorship if that makes sense. So Jack what is today's topic? What are we talking about? So today I want to talk about uh, an element of the game that I think is of mine that's vastly improved um, by and developed by working with you guys uh, in particular and the rest of the Vanguard team um, to improve my game. And that is decision making and analysing risk and opportunity. Yeah, nice. I think it's a huge one, isn't it, really, where people can go so wrong. Absolutely, yeah. It's um, it, it's it's the key component of the game. After you um, get under the bonnet of all the rules and stuff, it's it's your decisions at the tabletop that matter. Yeah. Um, in you in your strategy. Nice. No, I think it's going to be a fantastic episode. I think we can um, really share our experiences, what we've learned over the years, uh, playing in so many tournaments between us, and I think we can give a really good overview of maybe some of the things that um, you guys, if you're new to the scene. Um, of competitive play will probably make so hopefully you can learn from our mistakes and not make them yourselves or maybe it will help you if you're going through these struggles yourself at the moment then hopefully give you some other things to think about in ways to overcome so mark where are we going to kick this off with um i would love a bit of a in-depth overview of uh from jack to give everybody a flavor of uh, the tool that he's got for everybody to use okay so um I think what you know when I started off playing 40k I was very much I would make an action uh, and you know move and shoot uh, charge or whatever it might be but not carefully considering your opponent's reaction uh, so you know every action you make uh, a appropriate ca- reaction will happen to that um, so I, I, you need a tool to then consider that when you're making a decision have you considered your opponent's reaction to to what, what whatever you've just done uh, and the way that I've kind of summarized it to myself is before making a decision or a choice, have a think about what's the worst outcome of this action, what's the probable or the average outcome of this action, and what's the best outcome from this action. So that's kind of how I've summarized it uh, easily for myself to kind of think about in game every time I'm going to make a movement or target priority, et cetera, is kind of just re- just think about those it, it, through in my head before I do that action. 
In which one do you tend to um, like lean more towards? Uh, t typically, be the the, the probable the probable the probable outcome. Um, so, it, what is likely to happen? But then that may change depending on where I am in the game. So, if I'm up on points, I might start taking might might start assuming the worst case outcomes in my decisions because I don't need to take any more risks. I can sit back a little bit because I've already I'm already clocking up the points, so I don't need to then overextend myself. So I could I could take a bit of a worst case analysis of what's going to happen to make sure that then it, the game doesn't flip out on its head. If you if, if you understand what I'm saying, and, and and conversely, if I'm chasing a game, I might make decisions assuming that I'm going to get the better um, outcome or the best outcome of what I'm going to do because I need to change the the flow of the game. Yeah, the dynamic. Um, yeah. Yeah, and when you're talking about the probability there, you're thinking like, how effective are I going to be? You know, am I going to need to, you know, for example, hit averagely, wound averagely, then fail average amount of saves and do the average amount of damage you would expect to remove those casualties, right? That's yeah, kind of, absolutely. In terms yeah. of pro in, yeah, in like math, Hannah, right? The probability, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and obviously you can. There's ways you can manipulate dice and um, boost your averages, and you, you'd also add in, you know, as part of that probable outcome. Um, you build a redundancy into that um, because it, you know it is dice to swing, so you do whatever you can to make sure that that thing happens, um, which oh, it really happens if you um, also add a bit of redundancy into that uh, shooting or a melee or whatever you might need to be doing. Yeah, nice. Yeah, really good. So, could you give us an example of how um, you might use that? You know, more a detailed example, Jack, on the uh, tabletop, or maybe you know, situation that you've been in yourself where you have utilised it. Um, yeah, oh, definitely. So, um, you know, I think a good example is um, units that have the infiltrating ability. So, that's a common one to be a Space Marine scout. Um, so, you're in you're in deployment with your scouts. So, so what do you do with them? Uh, let's say you're facing a combat army so you could then the best case is you could deploy them in the midfield on objectives um, so they're holding up field objectives and then also um, providing deep strike denial bubbles uh, gaining ball control the probable case is they'll hold it for your turn but your opponent will likely kill them because they're out on their own in the middle of the board but then the worst case against a combat army is that that scout unit or infiltrating unit is then wrapped by your opponent so that gives them free movement and then ball control and then they're safe from shooting for your next turn so in that scenario do you put your infiltrators on the midboard? i think the answer is no you put them somewhere safe i think what you're doing there is your the probability is nothing to do with dice in that example does it and actually that is a probability based on your opponent's playing level and skill isn't it so you're like thinking yes. right the decision here is if I put if I put the scouts up front, the best case is I move block, I zone out, it's gonna be great for me. They're gonna hold objectives, they're gonna do all this wonderful thing, but then a lesser skilled opponent might let you do that. They might let you screen you out in but then a top tier player will go, Yeah, cheers for the rap, mate, thank you very much. Yeah. And there's yeah. been situations where I have um completely under analyzed my opponent's behavior where i've played far too cagey and it's really punished me because i've like i've assumed that they're going to play this like most perfect game they're going to know my army inside out they're going to know exactly what counters me and ultimately i predicted their play and in reality they didn't play anything like it and it, it actually meant my w uh, win uh, was much, much harder than it needed to be. So, um, yeah, I think that's a very interesting one because you don't, unless you've played that person before or you know of them, it's very hard to judge in, like you said, guess their probability of their playing skill, which is a factor of yeah. the game. You're not just playing the game on the tabletop, but you're also playing the game between two two minds, aren't you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, you know, I feel like kind of... Um comes up again in later on in some of the topics we're going to discuss as well is reading your opponent and their mentality to the game you know if aggressive or defensive etc so yeah. um, um and uh, you're probably trying to guess their next move aren't you yes and uh, no, no, that's um you know, the whole basis of a 
overall game strategy, isn't it? You know what you want to do, but as part of to inform your strategy, you're trying to understand how your opponent's going to counter to it. Counter to it. Um, so it's, 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 a, it's a battle of minds as well as, a, a, you know, models on a, on a tabletop, isn't it? Yeah. So, Mark, I've got a question for you at this point, mate. If that's all right. Go for it. Now, Go obviously, this is like the first time you've heard Jack speak about this concept in a tool that he uses. Okay. Now, I'm going to put you on the spot here, mate. But this is how a lot of people are probably sat listening to the podcast right now. I'm going to put you on the spot also with them. In terms of gaining that knowledge of what's probable, what's unlikely, and what's like worst case scenario, what things could you draw on or use to help you make an accurate decision on what's probable? Okay. Before I answer that question, I'm just going to take one step back, if you don't mind, to yeah. summarise what Jack said to make sure I've understood the tool correctly. Yeah. So what Jack's saying is offering his uh, or a a way of thinking um, to utilise a tool to utilise during the game to help make the correct decision. If I've understood correctly, Jack, that's the uh, absolutely succ- correct. Yeah. Succinctly. So what I would say, I think an important point is that. Um, in any situation for any player uh, new to a uh, faction or you know new to playing a new opponent, new faction, etc., you can actually stress yourself out a bit by worrying about whether you've made the right decision. You can hesitate and or dither, and I've done some dithering myself, so I'm guilty as anybody, um, <laughs> which then increases the time that you take uh, during your game and can slow things down for you and your opponent. Um, so, and all those things could be fairly negative and um, that's a situation we want to get away from so Jack's saying here's a useful tool um, and you're going to look at three things the worst outcome, the probable outcome and the best outcome so the question you asked me Steve was like uh, how do you gain the knowledge to fill up those three answers because you answer in three questions and you try to answer them quite quickly Yeah. well um, I actually answered this something similar uh a question like this in uh, the uh, academy uh, Facebook group the other day to one of the guys, and I said, right, don't worry about making the wrong decision. Um, but the great thing is that you're asking yourself the question, did I make the right decision? You're going back over your game, you're analysing it. So first and foremost is sometimes you do make the wrong choice, but going back over the game with a friend or with us, if you're in the academy or whatever, uh, can be really helpful you know, saying what were the options I could have taken and thinking about what your possible paths were. So the second thing is, I said to um, this gentleman, I said, the more repetitions that you get with your force, the better. Um, And this is something that we've preached for quite some time. If you've got a faction or, you know, um, uh, a new list or whatever it is, the more reps you can get in, uh, the better, because you can answer this, any of those three questions much easier um, and the more armies you can play against and the worst matchup for you you can play against, the better. And sort of third and, and finally is uh, knowledge of your opponent's faction and what you think they can do as well. Again, it's it's about experience. So as my advice was, you're doing the right thing, carry on, but keep going, keep getting reps in, and you'll understand whether or not um, you've made a you know a valid choice. So in this situation, I would say it's the same thing. Like worst outcome, um, what do I think my opponent can do to me? Or, uh, you know, can he kill this whole unit? Can he kill large parts of my army? Can he get in somewhere I don't want him to? Probable outcome, you know, have I played this matchup before? What can my uh, unit, my faction, deliver in this this area? Um, and the best outcome, uh, again, is, you know, my experience of this matchup, my experience of the unit that I'm using. Um, quite a long-winded answer, but I think that really what I'm talking about is sort of uh, experience, and I think that that's a really valuable I, factor. Yeah. So you th- go on, Jack. What are you going to say? Uh, and I think with, um, uh, I, I imagine some people are thinking and listening to this, saying, "Oh, you know, I haven't got time to, to you know, analyze all this." But um, you know, b- building on from Mark's point is that with the experience, you already know what to do, and that's that particular situation against that particular unit or opponent etc you already know what to do 
because you've already played it out before. So when you get the experience in, you build up loads of little interactions together, you know, against yeah. a really strong combat unit, a really strong shooting army, whatever it could be. You build a portfolio of knowledge of how your army interacts with a plethora of different armies. Yeah, love it. So what we've got there, just to kind of summarise this, and if we take aspects from different players that we know, like Dan, for example, um, who's on our channel, we've played many battle reports with Dan. Dan doesn't get much time to practice, does he? Um, no. <laughs> however, Dan is extremely good at math. So what he's able to do is go, right, what do you hit on? What's your ballistic tier? What's your, you know, or can I see your stat profile? He'll look at that and go, okay, cool. He'll know the outcome, right? He'll know exactly what his unit will do to yours based on the probable outcome of dice rolls, yeah? Yeah. yeah. How, so that's how he works. He's very sort of, he's able to pick up a faction, know the stats, and he can do okay with that based on that. However, he will get unstuck in uncertain situations because his knowledge may not be there because he doesn't have time to keep abreast with everything because of his lack of uh, game time, which means he will come unstuck against things that are hyper-buffed or stacked upon. Does that make sense? So like, let's say Repentia on, on base don't do that much, but when you've got all the stacks from the Codex on them, which are quite easy to do, they become extremely good. So therefore, you're going into that matchup and not really understanding, based purely on math, what that can do. And you only learn that from the other two things that Mark spoke about, is knowledge of that faction and your faction. So you've got acquired knowledge, and then you've got also acquired experience as well, like you've just said there, Jack, where all of these things added together make, helps you make faster decisions and most importantly, more accurate decisions, which will hopefully lead to more wins at the tabletop. Because if you make even the best decision slowly, you'll lose the game because you won't get to turn six, right? And yeah, if you spot on. and if you make super fast decisions, but without the right knowledge, then you'll just make bad decisions and you'll lose the game. So you, you need to be able to juggle all those things all at once, which is why we come back to my original um, standpoint on most things for new players, which is take a unit and take it multiple times because you're going to learn what that unit does at that number. So with Sanguinary Guard, I just run units of, um, with F8. So that's kind of like my magic number because I know exactly what eight Sanguinary Guard do. You know, I don't have a unit of nine, a unit of seven, and a unit of six. I just have a unit of eight three times. So I get used to, yeah. I've got enough reps in with a unit of eight sanguinary guard to know exactly what it does time after time yeah yeah so you know that example um you know when to charge one unit in or two units in or three units in mm -hmm. to get the job done so you can you can easily make that decision on the fly because you've you've practiced at that unit size so many times yeah exactly yeah nice i think that um there's something that you've talked about before steve um you know, a lesson, maybe on one of the lives that we did on YouTube, you know, um, Aeons or God, it seems like now. And the advice that you gave to uh, those people was to say, right, when you're in a game uh, and you're talking about, like, the beginning of the battle round, let's say, and you're analysing um, a, uh, a matchup, so you, you've you got, uh, your advice was, you've got an overarching strategy for what you need to do to win the game. So one of the advice you know pieces of advice you were given was look at scoring points to win the game don't just try and table the guy you know so if you're playing itc what secondaries do i need to score and to break it down the advice was right what do i need to do to win the game what's my opponent need to do to win the game and then when you get to the start of the turn or um or phase you are what do i need to do in this turn or this phase to score points to win the game and how can i stop my opponent from doing what he needs to do I think that this is a similar tool, um, but this is a bit more granular because you're a, a, a like a, a a point. Do I charge this unit? Do I, you know? It's not like your overall strategy that uh, uh, we're asking for. This. Now, I think that this is like uh, um, not an advanced tactic, but like something that's not easy to do. You know that you've got to really practice it. Both of those are ways of thinking. So you've got to play it in you've got to practice it in all your games you can't just turn up at tournament and go to game five and go right i'm going to turn it on and use it now maybe some people can but i can't so i think that um and this is a question for jack really how often do you employ this strategy that um 
you know, is it every time? So you get really sharp with it, you can answer the questions constantly, or you're just using it to help you to make big decisions. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, yeah. I think um, because I've been playing, uh, my tournament army is Tau, and I've been playing that for two years now, uh, uh, basically uh, exclusively. Because the amount of bat reps I've got in it, it's uh, lots of it has become second nature. And I've played so many tournaments against so many different lists. I know fundamentally what I'm, the outcomes of most things I need to do. Um, so I can focus uh, in game about specific uh, problems that I'm coming across um, to then influence the, the direction of the game. Yeah, yeah okay. Nice. I see what you're saying. Um, do you um, do you agree with that point that I made there, Steve? Or you got a, you got um, a thought on it? You know, do you think that um, these uh, tools are from the same tree, if you like, or completely separate? What would you advise people? I think there's certainly a a hierarchy of decision making that a player will go through. You could you could basically. I suppose, go down to the finite minutia and look at every dis- single decision that you need to make and then run it through like Jack's tool of checklist. But I feel like it's going to be unachievable for some people and where you guys, and especially Jack, is able to use this very effectively is because he's got those repetitions in, which I think is immensely important because it obviously speeds up that play. Now, what I would say to somebody is... And this is what I've taught on the masterclass where we, you know, kicked off literally, it's literally a year ago, isn't it? We did our first ever masterclass. Yeah. And one of the things that I taught there was, look, you have, and I teach people to play very, very quickly. And it's all about being able to achieve 80% of the result in 20% of the effort. And that's a really good, I think, mantra to stick by. And with that, the tool is to look at the game and think, right, what do I need to hold? What do I need to kill? And what threat do I need to neutralize? So therefore you have three things to think about. Then you can add in Jack's three things to go, what's unlikely, probable and worst case. Yeah. Or what's sorry, best probable and worst case. Then there's only nine, nine single things you need to think about. And if you can do those nine things every single turn, you'll probably win more games than you lose. Or you'll certainly increase the likelihood. Uh, your vit- yeah, and your victory points coming in. Yeah, uh, that's true. Yeah, to, yeah. A, to a more consistent level. Yeah, um, which is important, especially in the ITC. Mm-hmm. Consistently getting up to you know the mid to high twenties, early thirties. Those th- those kind of consistent scores will lead you to more wins. Yeah. Um, anyway, so that's another important consideration. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, totally agree with that. Um. So I've got a question uh, for you both, but I'll start with you, Jack. Uh, in this situation, um, how do you go about what's your mentality on trade-offs? So you know you're going to say, um, "Okay, I'm going to I'm going to give up this unit um, to hopefully uh, you know see a turn ahead so that uh, he's put a unit um, in reach in my grasp." You know. Can I quickly jump in there before you answer? Yeah, that, Jack? Jack. okay. So a lot of people talk about points of a unit and they're like, um, and, I, and I've seen there's videos, there's content, whatever, or people will talk about it in terms of, um, in sometimes in our chat groups and things. And I do try and discourage this. And it is a case of going, uh, people ask me all the time about the points value with the death company. They're like, oh, but they never make their points back. That's what they're worried about. That, that thing will never make its points back. You can't look at the game like that. And I don't think that point for point, so when we're talking about trade-offs, that's not what we're exactly referring to. At some point, yes, it it can be uh, effective, but it's not always, because there's so many coefficients for the unit or role. Um, Yeah, so if you think about points, but when you're in-game with your lists a lot, points are irrelevant. Um, You've both got, a number of models on the board, and so, and some of them will be more effect will be more effective in this certain matchups and less effective. Yeah. Uh, um, so the points are, are less relevant when you're playing one opponent in a tournament setting. So the important thing about the trade-offs is that you know you're either well the general principle is you want to be trading off on your terms. So you want to say well I'm going to give you this unit, but I know by 
you taking the unit that I've offered you that I can then counter and take you out. Um, so you're you're setting the game up at your tempo. You're setting the trade up um, effectively. So you're trading. You want to make sure in effectiveness that you're trading up, or it, or you're trading up in victory points in the long term. Yeah, or in terms of the value in which that unit's going to bring to the game, right? Because you yeah. could have a high value unit in terms of how many points it costs, right? However, in this given environment matchup, it might be completely worthless to you. And actually, there could be another unit that you need to and will be much greater value in that matchup. A good example is a game that I was coaching um, when we had um, a Thousand Sun list with Magnus in Rubric Marines versus Gene Steeler Cult. And in my opinion, the Thousand Sun player was very worried about his Magnus staying alive, which is his normal go-to feeling. I need to keep Magnus alive because he'll, you know, be my MVP. When actually against Gene Steeler Cult, the rubrics were the hidden gem that he didn't quite, I think, think about until I broke it down in such a way to say that the volume of shots is what's going to absolutely decimate the Gene Steeler Cult. But he gifted away his rubrics too early in the game. Now, point for point, they could be something similar, yeah? Or Magnus could be more expensive than the rubrics. I mean, I don't know into, off the top of my head. But my point is, you cannot just throw away. You need to understand, again, with the decision making, who is my most valuable unit on the table here in this given scenario? So it can change as well. And that only comes from experience, right, as well? Yes, yeah. You know, um, uh, I was, uh, an example, I was playing a, a Dark Eldar player who had some, some Talos, some Ravagers, and a load of Grotesques. And I was playing my Tau. Um, and I, and I realised that if I just cleared off the Ravagers and then just put a, a, a um, wall of drones in front of all my suits, he had no firepower left to then charge any of my suits. He'd have to charge drones. For, so you, you might lean towards, I need to kill the Talos, because if they get into combat, um, they're going to do some damage. But actually, no, if I kill the Ravagers off, he ain't, he's not going to make combat for my suits. Yeah. So it's kind of... it's And that, and that means I've got free reign of the board to then... Um, move without worrying about getting shot by the ravages, and I, I knew it was a probable outcome of me killing them as well. Yeah, because I, I could shoot the Talos and bounce off because of four up Invan, for example. Uh, but if I can shoot the ravages, I knew I could kill all three in a turn. So actually, get that done, and I know the threat from the Talos is coming later, and I can deal with that later on. I don't need to deal with that now. Yeah, nice. Yeah, and I suppose in that example you've got there you even if you're uh, you put your shield drones up front and the talos hit them uh, they'll do a lot of damage to them but they can't be wrapped because they've got fly so they just move away yeah so you can move back you can shoot and maybe you do that every turn just to make life very difficult for that player um but like you say if you'd uh, not shot the ravagers ravagers could have you know made a mess of the shield drones you've only got the suits left then and the talos are then um you know can get stuck straight into them I yeah, think it's a really exactly. good example. So that's a, that's an example of uh, uh, of sort of trading, yeah, trading off because you you're saying I'm I'm a, I'm going to allow my shield drones. I'm going to have to make this move to shoot the ravagers, not shoot what's coming towards me um, right at the back of the board, to then trade off my drones to give me more time to do what I need to do in the game to get the points. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I think that's Which a really it, good example. It, it, it's it's kind of count. It's counterintuitive because you've got all these scary combat units charging your line and you're not shooting them. You're shooting something behind them. Um, but it, it, it worked in the overall strategy um, of that game very effectively. So I think that the, we go back to the, the base lesson that you've introduced, you know, worst outcome, probable outcome, best outcome. And you, um, the, the example we've given there is about trade-offs. And thinking about that, I think that's a really good point you've made there, Steve, about not thinking about things in a points value, uh, because you could have a, a, a very low pointed unit, which is incredibly, which is scoring the guy loads of objectives, like Nerglins, at the one I can think of, that um, if somebody's yeah. got some sat on, you know, uh, on a board somewhere, getting them points, what do Nerglins cost? I can't, I can't imagine it, it's very, very much, you know. Yeah, but their value is immense. Or yeah, just that's even... it. Yeah. Or even a very like a character that you know, for example, there's a lot of buffing characters that cost a lot of points, but they're never going to actually ever make their points back. 
But what they do is, in terms of just raw killing ability, but they allow your rest of your army to function, or even if that character sat on the objective for four turns, great, perfect. You know, it's, there's, yeah. there's value in there's value in the size of the unit. Yeah, how how much area can it physically take up in the board? There is value in that. Yeah, there's value in terms of your base size as well. So there's huge, so many different ways in which you can. Um, quantify value, I think. Okay, so when you're uh, using this tool, or you know, a decision decision making tool, um, we talked about trade offs there. What about baiting, um, Steve? Do you think you could uh, talk about that? Yeah, so I think um, in, in, me and Jack have got a great example of a bait. I think where Jack um, was trying to bait me, and the reason why you would bait somebody is to try to get them to in. It's like a pattern interrupt. Okay, the the game's currently flowing along nicely, and you're trying to bait them by giving them something shiny. Okay, you're trying to like you're trying to distract them from doing something that they actually want to do. Okay, so. They've got a game plan, and if they stick to it, you know that you're going to lose that game. So a pattern interrupt is something to, you know, maybe entice them to go for a bigger win, or maybe they haven't um, quite figured out that they're going to win that game, and if you can bait them appropriately, um, and you can essentially then counter. And what you're trying to do there is counter on their, their valuable unit. So you're trying to draw out their most valuable unit, and you're trying to destroy it, so therefore your valuable units are free to do whatever they need to. So often, you can look at your list and go, right, this is my MVP in this game because it will destroy most of their army alone. Now, it has, the opponent has this one unit that if it kills my MVP, will actually then be um, their MVP. So I need to bait out that unit, get rid of it, destroy it, and all of a sudden, I'm back to my game plan and I win. Yeah, so it can either be... Um, a sort of counter defensive bait or it could be like I said it's a pattern interrupt bait so there's normally a couple in and, and Jack we had this exact thing didn't we yeah, um, yeah. In, in, but the bait is highly risky isn't it or can be highly risky yeah so if I, I'll talk about the example that I was thinking about um, it was when we were playing at greetings for the warp it was um, your blood angels against my towel yeah um, and you are hunkered down at the centre of the board. You scouts everywhere, so full board control, getting the hold more every turn. And, the and I was struggling for line and a bonus. And I was struggling for line of sight to get my kills. I was, you know, I was getting my one. Um, but you were also, you know, throwing throwing a character or, or um, some scouts to get some kills or whatever. So we're drawing on the kills. You were getting a hold more bonus. Um, so I had to change the flow of the game. Um, otherwise, I was just going to lose. Um, I couldn't stand where I was. I had to take some risks so um you know i had to i had to provide bait to steve to tempt him out um and the interesting thing um so i, I moved the riptide up one flank uh unfortunately i couldn't get line of sight with his initial moves so i had to boost jump him up the table further uh, and I, I threw some drones with him and also put a commander up near in support um so after the riptide had made its final uh, move in the assault phase it had full line of sight on the entirety of steve's army so it's steve had to go deal with him somehow because otherwise you can't just leave the riptide to, <clears throat> to get free reign for a turn it, 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 it could potentially put out a lot of damage to sanguinary guard and death company etc so it was a problem that steve had to react to um but it was just ha uh, and i was hoping he'll send his whole army out so that means i could then get out of line of sight and the important one of the important things with that is making sure, because I knew Steve had had to kill the Riptide in combat, not to put the Riptide behind a line of sight blocking Ruin. So if Steve wanted to charge him, he had to charge and then be in the open after. Um, so that was the plan. Um, which, um, and, then, and then you obviously countered, you came in and charged, and unfortunately with my poor placement, um, and I think it was the drones that were string stringing back that allowed you to do it, to to clip the commander in combat as well. Yeah, you gave me um, you gave me three charges. Yeah, a long um, bomb charge to the commander. Yeah. the short charge to the drones, and yeah. to the riptide. Now I wouldn't have made the commander by itself. No, and I actually think I failed my first charge, and I only could hit the 
the front part of the drones, but the second unit rolled a little bit higher, which yes. meant they could yeah. jump the drones to get on the back side of them. So then when they're, with their piling, if I destroyed the drones first, I could consolidate into the commander and kill him. Yeah, which um, which worked effectively, didn't it? You killed all three targets. And in such a... In that game where I need the kill more, it, it was just a big swing. It was it was the right idea, but delivered poorly by myself. Um, but what I did in turn, and it, it did become a bit of um, it started to become a bit of a photo finish because you brought three units out. I then shot back and killed a lot of your boys. Then, yeah. but then you reconsolidated back into your into your into your central position, um, just up then to hunker down for the win um, because I left my baiting too late. I needed to do that a turn earlier. Yeah. And then I, I may have crept up the scoreboard a little bit or and shaved a few points off you, and that might have been enough to swing the game. Yep. Um, but, you know, as like a good line army, um, it's imp that doesn't, nece doesn't necessarily have ball control. It's important to to think about the flow of the game. Actually, the, the better way to describe it is a late game army, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, if you're late, you need to know when you need to take your run at the, the, at the scoreboard. You know, is it turn three, turn four, turn five, turn six? When do I need to start getting hold more, kill more bonus? Yeah, to or, flip the game on the head. And how long can you allow your opponent to get the hold, hold more before you make yeah. a move? Yeah, exactly. And, and obviously, that that's influenced by um, secondaries mm -hmm. typically. How many secondaries has your opponent scored against? How you, how many you've scored is when that would decide when you need to make that step change. Uh, in your game, um, which you may use baiting as a tool um, to to do it. Yeah, and on the flip side of that, I would say we had a quick. This came up in our ch in the in the academy group was um, somebody said, "How do you stop yourself from being baited?" And again, you 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 check yourself, don't you? Is that yeah. unit part of my? Do I need to hold it? Do I need to kill it? Is it a threat? If it's if the answer is no to any of those three questions, you leave it. No matter how shiny and sparkly it is, <laughs> you leave it alone. Yeah. yeah, you need to be like the uh, um, I don't know, like the golden retriever dog that's just being told to sit and you know, like he has all these toys he wants to play with, but he's just got to be disciplined, sit there, and he'll get his treat or whatever, right? At the end. Um, yeah. So yeah, it, it it is very easy to be distracted, but you just have to be faithful and disciplined. Uh, towards your decision and you need to stick with your decision that's one thing I would say rather than being like a decision butterfly one turn <laughs> this is a game plan next turn this is a game plan no, devise a game plan stick to it, learn from it I think that's good advice um, The have you got any tips for uh, I think this is you know when we talk about uh, bait and if if you think you're being baited it's a it's a bit like a it's a bit like playing chess, isn't it? Very much simplifying it, you know. If I um, the guys uh, put a pawn out for me to take, but am I giving up, you know, a rook uh, that he's then going to smash? And then um, you talk about value, not in points of that faction, that force, that unit, whatever it is. The um, am I giving up a tool that I really need later on in the game to do something with? You know, will I really? Uh, struggle without it so i think that's one of the ways you can uh, evaluate it have yeah. you got any tips for people on like on how to do a good bait or how to analyze whether you're being baited you know um should i take that one jack oh uh, yes please mate i think in terms of a, what would be a bait is you knowing that that unit's not very valuable to you and just throwing it away or having a very valuable unit to you that's currently in a non-threatening position by putting it in such a position that makes it extremely threatening, it has to then be dealt with. So that was Jack's version of the bait, yeah? He's got yeah. a very high valuable target that in this position is a problem. I have to deal with it, yeah? Um, I can sit and just try and stick to my game plan, and this is where I'm contrary to my own advice that I gave a minute ago, but Again, I've got the experience to know, and I saw the opportunity with the commander and the drones. Otherwise, yeah, I may have just sat there and just thought, oh, I can weather this and end up not, and then Jack smashes me off the table, right? But Yeah, 
sometimes it could be like a non-essential character or it could be anything like that where you think I'm just going to push my limit a little bit this to see if they take it yeah or you know you feel like he's he's and you can pick up on cues on their personality as well if they've thought if they ask you particular questions about a certain unit so my my example here would be the magnus example magnus is normally a high threat unit i i just throw him away to that gene stealer cult army if i then knew my rubrics would pick up three units of acolytes yeah because i know that he's gonna have to invest a lot to kill magnus but then if i can pick up 60 acolytes in a turn because i shoot I split fire and then charge the the character that's giving them the free morale and then put some more attacks on those units. They'll just all pop to morale then, yeah? So um, that would be a bait where you're you're throwing away the, your, their perception of what is a high value target. And again, you can pick this up based on their, you know, how they act in the game, the questions. If they keep asking you questions about Magnus, you then all of a sudden you know that, hang on a minute, I think he's scared of Magnus and I don't think he's that good. I can throw him away here, yeah? That's where the psychology of the game comes in, and that's why it's such a beautiful game. Yeah, I love it. I like it a lot. I mean, it's slightly so, dirty tactics, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, what you, uh, you know, the the tool, if you like, that Jack's given here is a real positive tool, and it's a counter tool um, to counter stress. So, what we can all suffer from playing the game is the stress of losing a unit, um, losing the game, it going badly or whatever. So in if we flip it the other way and say, you know, things are going well, I'm, I'm feeling stressed, and then we might be guilty of tilt. What does tilt mean to you, Jack? So, um, you know, I think, yeah, I just say I think everyone's... Uh, guilty of this uh it's it's when you're you get um frustrated with what's what's happening with the game and you get um yeah you know you get stressed you get flustered um and then all of a sudden you could end, end up making bad decisions etc on that um so I, I think it's it's how you deal with tilt which is usually brought on by a mistake um and i think this is, this is part of the game that i've worked on well um i think as a principle that you got to accept that units will die you know you trade off units um they will die your favorite shiny model will get blown up at some point um but, but you well, what if i've spent a long time painting it uh, yeah. it's still it's still gone mate it's oh, uh, surely yeah, not it's... you can't target that jack <laughs> i spent i spent two weeks but... painting wreck this hq you just leave me alone <laughs> But it, it, yeah, except to the fact that you know models will die. But if you if you follow the, the previous steps we just discussed, your your opponent's killing them, killing what you've offered them, rather than what you want, uh, and you're keeping your most effective unit safe. Um, but then if you're you know when tilt kicks in, if you've um, if your opponent has a very good uh, dice rolling, uh, very good dice rolling, and you have some bad dice rolling, and then all of a sudden you're behind on the on the on the overall mission, and you're not working on your game plan, you may then start to chase the win and chase your losses basically, um, which will open yourself up to more risk, um, which then turns in pounds uh, bad decision making. Um, well, that feeds so, back into your tool, then, doesn't it? So basically, you, you yeah, know, you can utilize that tool and go, "Hang on, am I throwing this away? Or am I really gambling? If I if I take an objective look at it, utilizing that tool, utilizing the three uh, three areas, and maybe that you know brings you back, um, levels you down a bit, and you go, actually, if things are absolutely even not themselves as bad right. as, yeah, not as bad as you you first think when something unexpected happens. Um, and I think Mr. Box has got a great e example um, on how um, and how, how he kind of dealt with this. It's, you know, it was, I'm not, not sure stressful situation is the right one to call it, but um, you were really up against it, weren't you? Yeah, which one are you referring to, by the way? I'm referring to the element games when you're up against the guard oh. artillery. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, to, yeah, to, so... To, so, so I'll paint a picture. I, I'd finished my game and I popped over to Steve's uh, and, and he, he was looking very stressed. Um, and I, I had a quick word with him saying, oh, this game's done. To, to bottom of turn one, he's absolutely pounding me into dust of all his artillery. Um, he had very good dice. You had very poor dice. Um, I thought, okay, right, I'll leave it. He said, right, 
leave me alone. I need to concentrate. So <laughs> I left. I, I had a drink or whatever. Came, came back an hour later. Uh, you are a bit more chipper, weren't you? <laughs> well, I wasn't, like, <laughs> frowning and my eye wasn't twitching anymore. Yeah. 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 You'll, um... you'll notice you've a play me if I'm super serious. My eye will <laughs> twitch like mad. Yeah. Um, so I'll get... I'll, I'll, tell you what happened i was playing against an absolute gent corbin um and we're, and we're good friends now after that game and it was um yeah yeah we sort of really bonded over that game actually um now what happened was he went first he had uh, tank commanders basilisks and i lost my knight turn one i didn't make a, i don't think i made a single save i think one or two basilisks k- killed a knight which is he knew shouldn't have happened i knew shouldn't have happened <laughs> Um, it was certainly his best case scenario. Um, so I lost the knight, but I also lost two tank commanders and a unit of death wing, uh, death watch veterans, all turn one. I mean that is that's all, massive. <laughs> all I've got left is two units of vets um, and one tank commander. That's it. That was and then a couple of characters, but it was. I just had to think, you know, and yeah, it was a blow. But I'm not someone that will ever give up. Um, and he presented an opportunity because I think he felt like he had the game, yeah? And he, he brought this tank commander forward to get line of sight on something that... No, actually, it was he brought his tank commander forward because his character... It was the Maelstrom card where the character needs to secure an objective. And he didn't... But he didn't need that point. He didn't need that point to win the game. And... I charged this tank commander and I wrapped it and every single turn because I've got death watch that can fall back in charge um, and because I had a captain in combat with this tank I never had to physically leave combat because uh, my captain could just stay in combat with it but then the unit could disengage shoot and charge in every single turn so I can disengage uh, shoot off a unit then close it back up again. Meanwhile, my character's just dotted about and grabbed the board. So every time he tried to move in advance, my Death Watch would just move out, kill the unit that was moving, and then I would close it back up again so it could never be shot until I actually wanted to then kill it at the end of the game, and I ended up winning um, by a pretty significant amount. But it just goes to show that the Knight wasn't even needed to win that game. Uh, but then if Corbin would have played maybe slightly different, then I, there would have been nothing I could have probably done about it. Um, however by seeing that opportunity and again that comes from experience like Corbin now will know exactly what a Death Watch unit of veterans does when it's got a bike <laughs> that allows it to fall back and charge and a, and, a, and a Vanguard vet that allows it to fall back and shoot so he probably won't make that mistake again um, and that's all about like learning from those experiences and it is a real case of like when I when I suffer from tilt I will often um, and I'm I must admit, when I play Brian, obviously I do like to wind Brian up when I play test with him. I'll go, oh, Brian, you've won this game easy, mate. And he will then, <laughs> he'll play really aggressive against me. And I'm like, I right, just fall into my trap, Brian, I got you. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it is a case of... Um, sneaky trick. It is a little bit sneaky. Uh, yeah, and, and poor Brian, um, and he knows it as well. He knows I'm doing it to him. But, uh, yeah, falls for every time. But, um, anyway, it's just a case of um, understanding, yeah, bringing it back to what do I actually need to do to win this game, yeah? Do I need to be this aggressive? Yeah, I think that the um, the counter to tilt, uh, to being stressed out, is to have the tools, the decision-making tools that we've talked about uh, in this podcast to utilise and also... I think my advice to anybody listening is um, if you're going to try and use them, use them every phase of every game of every game you play and then they'll become second nature and you'll be able to switch onto them dead easy. It'll reduce your stress, which will make sure you you don't get tilt and you don't make, ag- you know, um, exaggerate your decisions and go for something crazy. Yeah, and often when you people tilt because they actually have a lack of knowledge and they have a lack of experience, and they therefore underestimate what's probable. So they'll go, oh, I should have easily killed that. And actually, no, you don't. You don't easily kill that. That would have been best case scenario. You would have achieved what you thought you should have achieved. But actually, you shouldn't have, yeah? And I tend to normally play down the what's worst case scenario because I typically know my dice rolls ain't great. I've never been, no, no one's ever gone, Steve, your dice rolls are hot. You know, I, I don't have those nice stories that you do, Mark, about dice. But 
Um, that's why I normally edge on the side of caution, which means I'm a very, very cautious player, which means actually when I play, I get quite stressed out in terms of internally, but not externally. I try not to let it show what's going on. Like sometimes I try to be like the, the duck that's pedaling furiously underwater, but looking like he's calm and collected on top, you know? Be a oh, duck, that's like, the message. Sounds like you got a new nickname for, uh, for Mr. Box there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The duck. <laughs> the duck, yeah, I love it. Can I be the swan? You're welcome. Slightly more uh, gracious. Elegant, yeah. yeah. I'll be the swan, yeah. Um, yeah, anyway, so I think we should probably wrap that up. We've got some questions, haven't we? Let's get stuck into them. Quick fire round. It's, it's going to be a very quick fire round because I have to head off shortly to do the live that I do every single day. So if you just quickly on that, every single day I go live at 6 p.m. British summer time to answer your questions. Sometimes we pick a topic, sometimes it's just a free for all, but come and join in, get your questions answered. Um, so anyway, without further ado, let's crack on. Um, I will throw these at you, okay? Okay. So get ready, ready. To, get ready to catch them. Right, Jack, I've been meaning to ask you with this one for ages. Um, what do you think of the new Dark Angel since the FAQ? Um, I think that I, I think they're fine. Uh, I think lots of a cert one build, which is all the flyers, um, got nerfed. Fine, uh, but you can give the heavy Doctor in back to all the Raven Wing back for another turn, so you can deal with that. Um, but I think with the Deathwing Knights, which are the standout unit. They didn't get affected, and they've got an absolutely amazing buff for, for a Psychic Awakening. Yeah, and also Ravenwing, you know, the, their units go mental in Tactical and Assault anyway, don't they? So they want to be in the Assault in Tactical Doctrines. Yeah, I think everyone just jumped on the um, Ravenwing Flyer spam, uh, which was very good. And uh, the Talon but... Master spam, yeah? Yes, correct. Yeah, so that's certainly a build. But no, nice, Jack, I love it. So, okay, um, we've got a question here. Uh, Jack, no, I'm gonna no, Mark. Sorry, Mark. I'm gonna go this one to you, Mark. What great model needs better rules? And this is from John. Logan Grimnar. Logan. Okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, cha on, chapter Master of Space Wolves. On the. You um, don't see him on the tabletop. On the chariot thing. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Avoid that. Um, just because it looks so awful. <laughs> he's all, on the chariot. He's all over ten wounds, so he can be targeted. Yeah, but he, um, I think he looks great on that thing. I, I, no, I'm, I'm not keen on it. Okay. Um, the because I've, I've seen too many of the people that have painted him as Father Christmas on his sleigh, <laughs> and it's uh, <laughs> I can't get out of my head. Um, I'd I'd love to see him have some better rules. His points have come down, but I'd, I've never seen anybody take him. Um, he just doesn't do enough for the points. I would love to see him at, be really potent, be offer uh, something special. He's one of this, you know, in the law, the Imperium's greatest leaders, uh, greatest fighters. Okay, nice, um, Jack. I'm gonna put that same question to you. What great model needs better rules? Land Raider. Oh yes, yes, I agree, hundred percent. There. Great call. Yeah. Uh, What's your choice I for this? Thing? Iconic. Um. Oh, I mean, I would have said Dante, but he needs a better model as well. He's well just, both. Why not both? Well, th this is the next question: is what great data sheet needs a better sculpt? So what? What is there? Um, and I would say for this, Shining Spears. Shining Spears are a great, great, great data sheet. Just need an upgrade, don't they? They need the aspect, you know, like the Banshee's got. the ban They need the aspect treatment. Um, so, yeah, that's my answer. Right, um, this one's for Jack, okay? When's cr that Chris bloke coming back on? He was insightful and boyish, attractive, I assume. <laughs> this is from Chris, by the way, Jack. How oh, is it? Uh, well, never after he insulted my town. So um, there you go. Move on. <laughs> Bye, Chris. Last doing you. <laughs> no, I actually think Chris is pretty good on the podcast. We need to get him back on. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. It was great. It was it was great fun that uh, that podcast. I look forward to um, seeing him on the uh, podcast again. Yeah. Well, when when we do a big VT get together, uh, yeah, he'll definitely be bringing his orcs down. We we'll have to get him here. Okay, this is a question for Mark, and it is a question for Mark. It states a question for Mark. So, if I wanted to run a non-primaris space wolf force, what would you use to fill a battalion? Um, right, okay. I would say 
three. You, you've got a minute. Go on. I, I can do it in less. Three squads of ten uh, blood claws with the wolf guard pack leader with the storm shield in. Um, I still think blood claws are fantastic. You so many uh, attacks. Um, you're going to lose some, so you got three lots of ten. You got thirty. You got threat saturation. I still think they're Trip, good. Triple drop pod. That's, that's, <laughs> Could be. That's, yeah, that, yeah. That, that was the specialist I was looking at. Um, nice. I think blood claws are cool. Cool. Yeah. Okay. I can get on board with that. Um, uh, Jack must have units in a fifteen hundred point Iron Hands list. Uh, a character dreadnought. <laughs> no. Actually, no, yeah, I shall. Uh, a storm cannon array, the Viathan dreadnought. So, that will tear face of 1500 points. So I'm, di- I'm going to disagree, and I'm just going to say mass intercessor spam with the apothecary, which has got the five up feel no pain banner and fairy to give you. Everyone's got a five up feel no pain, everyone's got a five up invun. Why well, are you just taking three units? He just cheated the question. Must have units. In a oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. but no, I agree with you. What you've said is strong there. Um, okay. I'd like to add my two pennies to that since I've just painted 65 intercessors. What do you take? Um, <laughs> for my uh, silver sabers, it's going to be 65 six, intercessors, fairy <laughs> horse, an apothecary, and a chapter master. I'd fill your boots, lads. <laughs> <laughs> um, how would you think about building a, a new army from scratch? I'm going to answer this one. This week, I'm going to be re- releasing my video on exactly how to do this, and I use Grey Knights as an example. How to be- how to write your list, all the thought process, building them, painting them, everything in a short turnaround. So that video is going to be spot on for you, Jimmy. Anyway, guys, it's been an absolute pleasure. This has been episode 13. If you want to get the show notes to this, um, you want to check out anything we spoke about, then all you need to do is head over to www.vanguardtactics.com forward slash blog forward slash EP13, and you can do that for all the other episodes. Also, if you head on Instagram and you check out at the Vanguard Tactics, you will see every week I put up a post asking for the questions on the story. You can send in your questions for that. I need to now go live, but guys, it's been an absolute pleasure. So thank you very much uh, for joining me, and I'll see you guys on another episode of the Vanguard Tactics podcast. Take care.